with your Bibles open to Acts chapter 6 that we've just read. We're going to go through that verse by verse, but would you join me in prayer, please? Thank you, Lord, for each person that has come today. Thank you especially for our guests. We have been praying here in our congregation that you will bring uh, guests to us every week, at least one. And thank you that you have again answered that prayer today. And there are some people here for the first time. And we give you praise. And we're thankful that they are here. And thank you for the uh, regular attenders who have come back again today. But Lord, we all want to hear from you. We want to respond to you in obedience and faith. I pray that you will fill me with the Holy Spirit to just as this scripture says, faithfully give myself to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Help me to do that in your power. And Lord, I am well aware this morning that I have nothing to say that would touch anyone's heart unless your spirit speaks through your word and through me. And so I ask you to do that today, and we ask you to do that. Make the, uh, the, this message alive to our hearts. Fill me with the Spirit as I speak. Fill each of your children with the Spirit as we listen. And Lord, uh, we know that the enemy would want to distract us and turn us away from hearing you today and so we claim authority over him as you told us to do you said to put on the whole armor of God and so we want to do that by faith just as Ephesians 6 says we put on the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth and the shoes of the gospel of peace we take in our hands our Bibles, the sword of the Spirit. And above all, we take the shield of faith to snuff out the fiery darts that the enemy would shoot at us. We confess our sins and we trust that your blood will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, Lord, help me to use the time wisely in these next few minutes to share your word and to challenge us in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, we are talking about selecting leading servants. Uh, We, two weeks ago, we talked about the church and what it is. Then last Sunday, we talked about elders and what they are. And today, we're going to talk about deacons and deaconesses and what they are and why we are asking you to nominate some folks and why we have these uh, lists of church members in the bulletin and why we have sections from our church constitution in the bulletin. Deacons, uh, I believe, originated in Acts chapter 6. So that's where we're looking this morning. The early church grew at a phenomenal rate. It was a supernatural thing. On the morning of the day of Pentecost that is mentioned in Acts chapter 2, there were 120 believers. 120 believers who uh, were gathered, and that was following the three-year ministry of Jesus himself. Uh, There were... A little more than that uh, who believed, but there were 120 gathered this morning. We know that from Acts 1, 15. But by nightfall that day, there were 3,120. And we know that from chapter 2, verse 41, where there were 3,000 new believers that came to the Lord that day. 
And the growth continued. In chapter 2, verse 47, we read that the Lord added daily to the number. In chapter 4, verse 4, 5,000 men were listed. In chapter 5, 14, they added multitudes, both men and women. Chapter 6, verse 1, the numbers increased. And chapter 6, verse 7, which is on the front of our bulletin, the numbers multiplied greatly. Now, wouldn't it be great to be a part of a church where the ministries were so effective and so consistent that people were being saved every day in Stanford? Wouldn't that be amazing? That was what was happening then. And uh, the Baptist Convention contacts us, uh, contacts us, the Baptist Convention of New England that we are part of, contacts us and says, we would like your annual report. Tell us how many members you have and how many you baptized this year. And we say, well, I'm not sure. Uh, a couple of months ago, we counted, and there were 5,000 men. We never did get the women and children counted. Uh, but we know that we at least got 5,000 men. And so I guess we'll just have to put down for our, our membership and our baptisms multitudes of both men and women. That'd be pretty amazing. Sounds impossible, doesn't it? But that's exactly what happened in Jerusalem. But I want you to notice that while that uh, God was working in such a powerful way, it could have all ended right here at Acts chapter 6, verse number 1, if the apostles had not handled a difficult situation wisely that is just as it is described here. Uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 1, Now in these days... When the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Now, who were the Hellenists? Who were the Hebrews? The Hebrews were, first of all, the, the Jewish believers who had grown up there in Israel. And they had mostly all lived in Jerusalem all their life. They spoke Aramaic, and they also spoke Greek. But mainly they spoke Aramaic. That was their heart language. And then there was another group, the Hellenists. They were the people who had grown up, they were the Jews mainly, who had grown up in other countries, but had migrated back to Israel uh, at some time in their adulthood. And so they spoke the languages of their home country, and they also spoke Greek. But they struggle with Aramaic. Can any of you identify with that? Struggling with the, with the main language of the new country where you live. Well, that was the situation there. And... Uh, as a result of the work of the Holy Spirit in that day, a lot of widows had been saved. And they needed help from the church. Some got food or money uh, regularly. Some got help apparently every day when they gave out food. But a complaint arose. And some of the widows who were from the Hellenistic group began to say, have you noticed that we're not getting help like the Hebrew ladies are? Somehow this just didn't right. And so the Bible study groups turned into grumble groups. And it wasn't long till it was beginning to be a divide in the church. And uh, one group was sort of beginning to feel resentment toward the other group. You're treating our widows like second-class citizens. We're just as important to the Lord as you are. Why is this happening? And so this grumbling started. You can see, here's a great opportunity for disunity. 
But all the time, the numbers are growing and growing and growing. And so the, this complaint comes to the ears of the apostles. And instead of taking it as a personal insult and a confrontation, and instead of denying that it is happening, or saying, how dare you criticize me, or instead of criticizing the widows for being hungry, they said, hey, let's deal with this issue. And so they put their heads together. They came up with a solution. We need helpers. They proposed to the church, select some helpers for us, and the church did. Now, which brings us to the reality that problems are not always bad things. Problems in a church can sometimes be good if they're handled right. Now, how are problems good? Well, there are at least three ways. First, a problem is an opportunity to evaluate and adjust our ministry. As a church grows, there are new needs that arise. And the new growth doesn't always fit into old structures. And sometimes you don't, we don't realize that we need to handle things in new ways and be doing things differently until a problem comes up. So a problem is good if it helps you see that there is an opportunity to evaluate and adjust your ministry. Second, a problem can be good if it is an opportunity to exercise our faith. Now, not just faith in the Lord, but faith in your fellow church members. Uh, the apostles discovered that they were trying to do mu too much. They had been managing the food distribution tables. And they were the, the, that ministry was gro growing so large, as more and more widows were being saved, um, that ministry was growing so large that they were beginning to neglect their main ministry, which was to preach and teach the Word. That's why they said in verse number 2 that it's not right that we should give up preaching the Word to serve tables. Not that they thought they were too good to serve tables. It just wasn't their main assignment. It wasn't their main priority. And so they discovered it's time to let some other folks get involved in the ministry. We need some help. They had to exercise some faith in their fellow believers. So, problems can be good when they are seen as an opportunity to evaluate and just, adjust ministry according to the new need, when it is seen as an opportunity to exercise faith in the Lord and in your fellow believers, and third, a problem is an opportunity to express love. We show love by listening. As I said, when, the, when this problem came to the apostles' attention, they didn't say, why are we being criticized? They didn't take it personally. They didn't take it out on the widows and say, those widows, you just never can satisfy them. They're always wanting something. They didn't do that. They looked at the facts. They examined it and said, you know what? They're right. We haven't intended to neglect anyone, but we have been neglecting someone. So let's, let's set it right. Let's do something about it. And so they used it as an opportunity to express love, and they said, we want to help these widows. So they said, choose out seven men among you. And the way uh, the election happened when the church chose, the church was predominantly Hebrews, but they chose seven men who all have Greek names. They chose predominantly Hellenist folks. So they said, we're going to allow these people to serve. They're not second-class Christians. They are vital to our church. And as a result, 
They set these men before the apostles. They put their hands on them. They laid their hands on them, prayed over them. They ordained them as deacons. And then it says the word of God spread mightily. Now, as I said, I believe this is the origin of deacons. But you will notice that these are not named as deacons in this passage. So why would we say this is origin origin of deacons? Well, it's because three times the word, the Greek word for deacon is used here. It is used in verse number 1, where it says their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The word distribution is a form of the word deacon. Because you see, deacon just simply means a servant. And to, to, be, to do the service of deacon is to serve. It's also used in verse number 2. The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. That is the word deacon, serve. And it's also used of the apostles' ministry down in verse number 4. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the deaconing of the word, the ministry of the word. You see, it isn't that the apostles felt they were too good to serve tables. As I said, they did not. They had already been doing that. But they had a ministry. They had a service that they were to do, and it was mainly teaching and preaching the word. They needed help in physical ministry, and that's why deacons were chosen. That's why this original group was chosen. So what are the responsibilities of deacons? Let me just be uh, quick about this. There are three main things that deacons are to do. And they are, while the deacon ministry is mainly to physical things, there is a spiritual ministry of the word involved with the deacon ministry. Number one, deacons meet needs according to the word. I see this in verses 1 to 3, that the deacon ministry arises from specific circumstances. The specific circumstance in the early church was the neglect of a growing group of widows. There was no such thing as life insurance policy on husbands that died. There was no such thing as social security or our care. There was no such thing as re- retirement funds. And if a widow had no son to move in with and take care of her, then she was just sort of left out. And women, by and large, were not allowed to do any, ma- any work. They couldn't go out and get a job as a clerk in a store. They couldn't be a salesperson. It was very limited what they could do. And so most, many of them truly needed help and they would starve otherwise. And the church stepped up to help in those circumstances. So the deacon ministry arises from specific circumstances. Our deacons are assigned Uh, different responsibilities. And they're listed here on on these pages. The green one tells us the responsibilities of a deacon. Uh, They are to assist at the Lord's Supper and baptism services. They're to aid in the spiritual care of the church. They assist in the preparation of worship services. They are to be actively involved in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are to care for the temporal needs of the members. They are to encourage, list, and support those able to help others. They are, in the absence of the elders, emergency decisions shall be made by the deacons and to perform other duties assigned by the elders. So deacons' ministry changes as the needs of the congregation changes. So deacon ministry arises from specific circumstances 
and deacons are accountable for specific commands. The command in this particular case was take care of the widows. That's what the Bible said to do. So they were fulfilling a biblical command and they were helping the church obey that command. And here in our church, as I've just read, the responsibilities of deacons is to help the church obey the command. The Lord's Supper is something we observe according to the Lord's command. Baptism is something we observe according to the Lord's command. Worship services are something we observe according to the Lord's command. And deacons help in all of these ministries. So the deacon ministry arises from specific biblical commands, and they're accountable for those. So deacons meet needs according to the Word. Second, deacons support the ministry of the Word. And because it relates to me, this is my favorite one. <laughs> uh, in verse number 4, after suggesting that they choose out these, these helpers, He's, uh, the, deacons, uh, the apostle said, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That is, deacons support the ministry of the word. How do they do that? Well, they take the burden off of the elders of the physical ministry so that the elders can faithfully fulfill their ministry, which is the preaching and teaching of the word and the Spiritual oversight of the congregation. You see, prayer and the ministry of the word always go together. Jesus said in John 15, 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. The word and prayer go together. You see... It is through prayer and the Word that we find God's will. Acts 1, 20 and 24. Through prayer and the Word, we overcome Satan. Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. Through prayer and the Word, the church's financial needs are met. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 15. Through prayer and the Word, the church is built up in every way. Acts 20. 32 to 36. And so when the apostles asked the church to select some servant helpers so that they could be faithful to their calling, they were putting first things first. We want to do what we can do faithfully and what we are called to do faithfully, so we need help in getting other things done so nothing and no one will be neglected. That's the deacon's ministry. And as deacons serve the elders so they can lead. Deacons lead others so they can serve. Now what do I mean by that? Well, obviously deacons cannot do all of the service. But they are leading servants who recruit others, which is one of the things our, our Constitution mentions. They recruit others and organize others to help do the ministry, the work of ministry. And one of the areas of recruiting is deaconesses. We have a group of, of ladies who come alongside the deacons to help in the ministry of service. And our Constitution mentions those, and they are specifically outlined here on the pink sheet. Uh, so deacons lead others so they can serve. Obviously, when there were thousands of people in Jerusalem, the seven guys couldn't do it all. So they got others to help them. And that's what's supposed to happen in churches today. And third, deacons meet needs according to the word. They support the ministry of the word. And deacons unify the body around the word. In verses 5 to 7. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And Philip, 
and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, Parmenas, and Nicholas, and the proselyte of Antioch. And these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And when the work of the elders is being faithfully done, and the work of the deacons is being faithfully done, when they are each doing their part and working together, great things can happen. And what could have been a divide that would have stopped the growth of the church was handled in a loving and wise way. And then we read in verse number 7, the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Some of those who had been most... uh, viciously negative toward Jesus became believers after they began to see the real ministry of the church and how the church worked in harmony and they heard the powerful proclamation of the word and they came to realize we were wrong about Jesus. We should not have rejected him and they embraced him with all their hearts. That's an amazing result. And I want you to look in one more place. Look over to chapter 21 and verse 20. Chapter 21, verse 20 of Acts. And when they heard it, they glorified God and they said to him, You see, brothers, how many thousands there are among the Jews who have believed. And this is talking about what had happened in Jerusalem after now toward the end of Acts, it's been 20 or 30 years since the day of Pentecost. And the word that is translated many thousands is the word myriads. And a myriad is 10,000. So... (laughs) What had happened was now there were tens of thousands of people into the Jerusalem church. How did that happen? It happened by the power of God and the word of God and the prayers of the people, but it also happened by the leadership of the church working together as the deacons and the elders came together and in harmony met the physical and spiritual needs of the, of the church body. And as this ministry was done in harmony, God continued to work mightily, and there was a spiritual awakening that spread all around the world. And here, 2,000 years later, we are in Stamford, Connecticut, of all places, talking about it and saying, This is what we need to do in our church. You see, as we're doing this, I I know that it's difficult sometimes to hear messages about elders and deacons and and all that because you're thinking, that man, that has nothing to do with me. And you can hope it doesn't. Because you don't need their ministry until you're in trouble. And you hope you don't get in trouble. But if you're in the hospital, you'll be glad that we have some faithful deacons. If you lose your job and it gets really tough for you and you need help, you'll be glad we have some faithful deacons. Now what kind of, de- what kind of men are qualified to be deacons? We'll look in verse number 3. They suggested four things and I'm going to bring this to a quick conclusion they said here are four general things number one they had to be church members therefore brothers pick out from among you seven men so they had to be church members they came out of the group number two they were to be Men of good repute. Men with a good reputation. P. 
people who could be respected for their family life, their church life, their work life. They wouldn't give a black eye to the church because of who they were. Number two, three, they had to be people who were full of the Spirit. And Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 to 21, describes someone who is full of the Spirit. They are a joyful Christian. They're a thankful Christian. They are submissive Christian in that they don't always have to have their way. They care about other people, and they're willing to listen to other people. And by the way, that passage is not talking about deacons. It's talking about all Christians. All Christians are to be that way. And also, they were to be people who were full of wisdom. So, filled with the Spirit, filled with wisdom, have a good reputation, be a church member. That's general. Turn over to Second, I mean, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And here are the qualifications of elders and overseers and pastors in verses 1 to 7. And then the qualifications of deacons in verses 8 to 13. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified. That's very much like the first thing of having a good reputation. They must not be double-tongued. That is, they don't talk one way when they're in one, with one group of people and uh, another way with another group of people. They don't talk nice to your face and then stab you in the back of, with your tongue, with their tongue, when you turn your back. They're not addicted to much wine. That is, they are not controlled by any substance like alcohol or drugs. They're only controlled by the Holy Spirit and by wisdom. They are not dis greedy for dishonest gain. That is, they're not controlled by money. In verse 9, they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. They must be doctrinally sound. Verse 10, let them also be tested first and let them serve as deacons if they... Uh, prove themselves blameless so we don't choose people that we don't know we choose people that have been observed over a period of time and they have been seen to be faithful in their walk with Jesus and in their service in the church we don't ever choose deacons because we like them we don't choose people as deacons because uh, we think they would feel really good if we elected them and um, maybe they would be more faithful. No, no. It's people who are already faithful. And next, their family life must be exemplary. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Verse 12, Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Now, as you see these these criteria, these qualifications from 1 Timothy 3 and from uh, Acts chapter 6, we're asking you to say, who fits that description? Who do you see in this? That's who you nominate. And that's who I'll be interviewing. So, here is the ministry of deacons. Does it matter? Oh, my friend, absolutely it matters. God has set this up, and next week we're going to quit talking about these, these detailed kind of things. 
we're going to get back to something that will be more applicable to everybody. But this is applicable to everybody in that we all need the ministry of our church leaders. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the fact that you have called leaders to guide the church. And Lord, we ask that you will raise up here at Stanford Baptist Church the kind of leadership who will faithfully serve this church, who will each take their responsibilities seriously, who will walk with you faithfully, who will grow in grace as elders and deacons and deaconesses and will be the kind of people, not just that our Constitution says they're supposed to be, but the kind of people that the Bible says they're supposed to be. Give us your wisdom, dear Lord. We put this now before you, and we ask you to help us in our walk with you. May we be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.